Hello and welcome to this video in which I'll be discussing a case of a patient presenting with hematemesis. My name is Ross McKean and I'm one of the clinical teaching fellows that has been teaching on gastroenterology for the last year. Much of my work on this subject has been in tutorials designed around cases that you might come across as a foundation doctor. My aim in doing this has been to make some of the theory you learn about more directly relevant and to guide you to areas of your learning that might require further development. That is what I'll attempt to capture in this video as well for you. I would encourage you to watch this video in a group, or at least in pairs, because there will be many points throughout where I will be asking you to pause and discuss your thoughts on the case before progressing. If that's not possible, at least ensure you have a pen and paper to hand so that you can jot down your thoughts. It is worth having the Clinical Companion to Gastroenterology iBook as well for reference. So, let's go straight to the ward. Jody, the nurse has asked you to see this patient, who just 10 minutes ago brought up a large volume of fresh red blood. You are the FY1 on a late shift and you are required to perform the initial assessment. But first, in order for us to get a bit of background on the patient, let's have a look at the admission notes for the patient when they came in a few days ago. So, the patient is a young woman called Jane Welsh, who initially presented with a two-day history of a change in bowel habit, in which she described her stools becoming dark and tarry. She admits to you that she'd been drinking a lot more than normal, consuming about two bottles of vodka over the last three days. She has a background of liver cirrhosis, secondary to alcoholic liver disease. Looking at her normal medications, you note that the patient normally takes thiamine, spironolactone, carvidolol and cotrimoxazole. Now this offers up a lot of clues actually as to Jane's past medical history as well. Have a think now, why might Jane be on these different medications? So thiamine. This is a tablet that is often given to patients who are heavy drinkers as they often have an element of chronic gastritis that impairs the absorption of several important vitamins including thiamine. In the long term, thiamine deficiency may lead to the development of Wernicke's encephalopathy and later Korsakoff syndrome. Spironolactone. This is an aldosterone antagonist that is used off-license in the treatment of ascites secondary to portal hypertension. This suggests that Jane has ascites, probably as a result of portal hypertension arising secondary to her liver cirrhosis. It is often used first line, ensuring the patient's potassium is of a normal range before starting it, as it has the ability to cause hyperkalemia. Carvidolol. Now the fact that the patient is on carvidolol demonstrates that she likely has varices, another complication of portal hypertension. Beta blockers such as this are prescribed in an effort to reduce the likelihood of variceal bleeds. And finally, cotrimoxazole. This suggests that the patient has had spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in the past, as this antibiotic is often started following treatment as a long-term prophylactic measure against it. So we can appreciate that Jane's health is pretty poor now, and is likely to have developed some serious complications from her cirrhosis. We now move on to her initial physical examination. Before doing this though, let's consider some of the physical signs you think you might see, given what we know already. So given that she has liver cirrhosis, clotting factors synthesised by the liver may be deficient, and therefore her INR might be raised. You might therefore notice the appearance of bruises. Her albumin levels may be reduced too, as this protein is synthesised in the liver, so this may manifest in the appearance of peripheral edema. What about her portal hypertension? What physical signs might arise because of this? Well, you might notice the abdomen is distended as a result of ascites, confirmed by the presence of shifting dullness. There may be dilation of the umbilical veins, so-called caput medusae. You might palpate splenomegaly, a marker of severity of portal hypertension. On the digital rectal exam, Given we know she's presented with Melina, we might see the appearance of thick black tarry stool on the finger. So what was picked up on the initial assessment? Well, it looks like she's dehydrated, but thankfully she was hemodynamically stable. She has ascites. 
And indeed, the presence of Melina is confirmed on the digital rectal exam. Bringing all this together, have a think what the differential diagnosis is here. So the differential would be an upper GI bleed, probably in this case because of bleeding from an esophageal or gastric varix, but could also be because of gastritis or a gastric or duodenal ulcer as well. Again, take a pause. What other causes can you think of for an upper GI bleed? Well, so there's a handy mnemonic I came up with to remember this, should you be panicking to think of a cause in an exam. And the mnemonic is top to bottom. So this stands for T for tear, so a Mallory Weiss tear. O for esophageal or gastric varices. P for peptic ulcer disease. Tumours, whether they be esophageal or gastric, that have eroded into a blood vessel. Another second O for esophagitis or gastritis. B for Boerhaaf syndrome, although an upper GI bleed as a result of this is uncommon. And then the final O is for odd vascular formation, in other words, angiodysplasia. Right, so given this, consider what your management plan is going to be. So we know Jane drinks a lot of alcohol, so there are a few drugs we need to think of to ensure that she does not develop alcohol withdrawal. We need to prescribe Pabronex, a solution rich in vitamin B compounds that will replace her thiamine in the short term. We will also prescribe diazepam or another suitable benzodiazepine, such as the longer acting chlordiazepoxide, prescribed as required and as per CIWA, the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment which is a scoring system the nurses employ to assess whether the patient requires the treatment and at what frequency. The patient is dehydrated, but there is no indication to initiate IV fluids as she is hemodynamically stable and mentally alert, so capable of drinking for herself. We'll want to send off bloods. What bloods do you think we'll need to take off? Well, a full blood count will be useful to assess if the likely blood loss she's had has meant she's anemic. And if her haemoglobin is low enough, then she might require a blood transfusion. So ensure you send a group in save as part of your bloods too, on the off chance that you might need to give her a blood transfusion. You'll also want to send off use knees. The patient may be dehydrated and this potentially may mean she has an acute kidney injury. This may also mean her potassium is raised exacerbated by the fact she is on spironolactone. Also using these are very useful, as often, a disproportionate rise in urea is one of the first signs that a patient has had an upper GI bleed. Liver function tests, LFTs, will obviously be important to check too. Has there been any derangement in the liver function tests? As an extension of this, check the clotting too. Jane might need vitamin K if her INR is markedly deranged. The ultimate investigation and treatment, however, Jane will require is an upper GI endoscopy to visualise the esophagus and stomach for the potential source of bleeding and to treat it. So we fill out Jane's prescription chart, continuing her regular medications, ensuring, as we've mentioned, that the potassium is okay to continue the spinal lactone first and prescribe her palpronex like so. So two pairs of vials given intravenously three times a day, stopping the oral thiamine. We send off the blood and book a non-urgent endoscopy. Right, now let's get back to the present moment now. You're unable to get a history from Jane. She is too unwell and she's in pain. Jodie's tending to a patient nearby and we call her over. What information will it be useful to ask Jodie, the nurse, about? So here's what you want to ask. Is their airway compromised? Now this will probably be immediately obvious to you on seeing the patient if they are making no respiratory effort or if they're displaying agonal gasping. This would be unlikely unless they have become so shocked as to drop their GCS to a sufficient level or that they've gone into cardiac arrest. It's a point worth noting, however, as this would require immediate intervention and the expertise of an anaesthetist to secure the airway. You'll want to know roughly how much they've brought up to guide fluid therapy. Extending on from this, we need to know if there has been any hemodynamic compromise, 
which would be reflected by a falling blood pressure and a compensatory rise in heart rate trying to maintain the cardiac output. Knowing their consciousness level is important, as mentioned already, to know if their airway is threatened or not. A useful rhyme to remember is intubate if GCS is less than 8, as at this level the patient's airway becomes compromised. What are their most recent blood tests? The most important factor to know here is, is their INR raised, requiring the need of vitamin K to reverse this. You'll want to know if the patient has venous access, as the patient is clearly going to require fluid and blood replacement intravenously. Does the patient have a valid group and save? This is important to know as they will require blood transfusion. Fluid alone will not be enough to restore Jane's intravascular volume. In this acute setting, however, you will likely be cross-matching without delay. Because this patient will require endoscopy and potentially require anaesthetised for this, taking an ample history is worth doing. So asking about any allergies, medications and past medical history, what their last meal was and the events leading up to this episode. Of course, we already know the patient's background now, but certainly knowing the events leading up to the hematemesis would be very useful. Does the patient have a catheter? Now, just think for a second why having a catheter in situ would be useful. So it's useful to have as this will guide fluid therapy. Remember that urine output is an indirect measure of organ, in this case renal, perfusion. If urine output picks up after fluid resuscitation, this is a very reassuring sign. Catheterization is the most accurate method of assessing the urine output. So you ask all these questions and pause the video now and have a think what you might want to do based on Jodie's answers. Right, off the bat, your approach as with any unwell patient should be A, B, C, D, E. So airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure. So A, airway is intact, so we move on to B and the SATs are 97%. But this is a medical emergency, so we should give them 15 litres of oxygen through a non-rebreathe mask. C, circulation, is obviously the ultimate problem here. This is a major hemorrhage, so we know we're going to need to dial 2222 and state this. Doing so will ensure that the necessary blood products reach the patient. So Jane is hypotensive as a result of her blood loss and requires a rapid fluid resuscitation. In order to do this, we need to insert two large bore cannulae into two large veins. When we're putting the cannulae in, we can also take off bloods. So we're going to want a full blood count, use and ease, LFTs, a coagulation screen, glucose, lactate, and blood for cross-matching. With the cannulae inserted, we're going to prescribe fluid resuscitation. Now, for resuscitation, plasmolite, a solution similar to Hartman's, is indicated. An alternative to this is human albumin solution, HAS, either 5% to 20%, but giving 0.9% saline is the least desirable fluid, given that Jane has ascites and so the fluid is likely to leak into this space and worsen this. Giving dextrose is contraindicated too, as this is not a resuscitative fluid. The rate will be as fast as you can give it, normally written as stat or over 15 minutes. Keeping with circulation, you'll want to do an ECG. So the patient's tachycardic, we need to know if this is sinus tachycardia or not. And though it's perhaps not likely, we need to ensure that there are no ischemic changes on the ECG which could occur as a consequence of global ischemia if the hypotension is profound enough. D is okay for the time being, and E for everything else. Making sure that we get the patient's BMs, and now we should ring gastroenterology to get into motion sending this patient for an urgent endoscopy, indicated on account of her hemodynamic compromise and melina, suggesting there is likely to still be active bleeding. So we've got the high flow oxygen on, we've inserted two large bore cannulae and we are taking the necessary bloods. We're going to prescribe an appropriate fluid for resuscitation and now we're at a point where we can phone the GI registrar. Have a go at this now, ideally with a friend, speaking out loud on how you would present this patient to the GI registrar. How was that? When I've given this workshop to students before and get them to present back their findings, it's often something they feel very uncomfortable in doing. Having a good, solid structure to stick to 
is something that makes it much easier. And one acronym that's often used is SBAR. It stands for Situation, Background, Assessment and Response. So if you haven't used this system in your previous attempt, why not pause the video now and have a go again and see how it compares, okay? Here's an example of how it should sound. Hi there, is that the GI Registrar on call? Hi, I'm Ross McKean, I'm one of the FY1 doctors. I'm phoning you with regards to a patient that is in hypovolemic shock after an episode of hematemesis. The patient is a 43-year-old woman called Jane Walsh, who is on the general medical ward. She is known to have liver cirrhosis and presented to hospital two days ago with a suspected upper GI bleed and has been awaiting endoscopy to investigate this further. Around 20 minutes ago, however, Jane brought up around 800 mils of fresh red blood and there is evidence of melina as well. On assessment, her blood pressure is 80 over 60 millimetres of mercury and her heart rate is 120. She has cool peripheries and her Glasgow Coma score is 11. I've therefore gained venous access and she is receiving resuscitation fluid as we speak. I've dialed 2222 to instigate the major haemorrhage protocol and I have sent off the necessary bloods. I would like you to come and see this patient as I believe this patient requires an upper GI endoscopy to explore and manage the source of bleeding as soon as possible. Thank you. Now that you're waiting for the bloods and for the GI doctor to come and review, have a think now what you can do with this time. So it might be obvious, but you must document what you've done in the notes. This is a legal requirement. You must reassess the patient as well. If Jodie hasn't already, ask her for a, an up-to-date set of observations, and you'll want these obs repeated every 15 minutes whilst Jane is as sick as she is. It's all very well and good giving these fluids, you need to ensure they are responding to this. If Jane deteriorates further, we are approaching peri-arrest territory, and we may well need to consider inotropic support if she remains hypotensive despite fluid resuscitation. We'll want to have a look at the ECG that's been taken too, and importantly, we need to get in contact with Jane's next of kin. So here's the ECG, and as you can see, there is sinus tachycardia and no ischemic changes. And now we've got the bloods back. Pause the video now and think about these bloods. The first thing you might notice is the fact that they are anemic. Their haemoglobin is 82. You might recall from the previous slide that their bloods from earlier showed a haemoglobin of 84. So this is surely unusual, no? Well, actually, in the acute setting, this modest drop in haemoglobin is often seen because remember, they lose their haemoglobin at the same rate as the rest of the plasma constituents in the blood loss. It is only, in fact, when you start to restore their intravascular volume that you get a true appreciation of what the haemoglobin drop is. More useful to look at is the urea and creatinine, in which the urea is disproportionately raised compared to the creatinine. This occurs as a result of the protein meal caused by the digestion and then consequent absorption of the broken down blood in the small intestine. You will also notice the INR is raised, so we'll need to reverse this. This should make it easier to control the bleeding. The APTT is raised too, indicating the need for fresh frozen plasma as part of the blood products required in the major hemorrhage protocol. The lactate is raised and this is an indication of shock, a good marker of how unwell the patient is. This should improve on fluid resuscitation as well. So I hope you have found going through this case useful. What I've tried to cover here is the general tasks that you as an FY1 doctor would be required to carry out. We've also managed to cover some of the typical causes of an upper GI bleed and appreciate the necessary investigation measures and management measures involved in such a situation. I'll leave you with a handy mnemonic that I made uh, that summarises the management of an upper GI bleed. And that mnemonic is ABCDE. 
So A for ABC, thinking of the general approach to any unwell patient. So here that primarily involves giving the patient high flow oxygen, inserting two large bore cannulae and resuscitating them. B here is for bloods, both taking away bloods and giving blood. C is for catheterizing the patient, important when thinking about response to fluid therapy. But also C here is for considering critical care if that fluid therapy is not sufficient to bring that blood pressure up. And also for insertion of a central line, which will allow a more accurate determination of responses to fluid therapy. D is for drugs. Do they need inotropic support? And also, if it is a variceal bleed that's been confirmed on endoscopy, often the patient will be given prophylactic tazacin and also terlipressin to prevent any hepatorenal syndrome. And the E here is for exploring the cause through endoscopy. Thanks very much.